God made us with a conscience, that little voice inside of us that speaks to us. It speaks to us every day. Sometimes it speaks kindly. Sometimes it speaks harsh. Sometimes it rebukes us or nags us. Sometimes it condemns us. And we all live as humans, and I think the words of Jesus perhaps describes all of us best. When he said in Matthew 26 and verse 41 to Peter, James, and John, he said, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's all of us. We all live with the nagging reality of sin. And we wonder and we worry at times whether or not we can be right with the living God and we can actually live eternally in heaven. Sometimes it even affects how we see Jesus, whether or not we will come to him because we feel so like we cannot measure up that we don't even try. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, when I get to the point when I can get over all of my difficulties and problems, I'll come to the Lord. And uh, you figure that they're looking at their lives and they don't want to lapse back into the way they used to be and they don't want that and so they figure if they can get to the point where they're nearly perfect that maybe then they could probably come. I'm saying that's really the wrong kind of attitude. If you're trying to fight all of your battles by yourself, you'll likely lose. Yes, if you're fighting all your battles by yourself, you will likely lose. Why not let Jesus help you? Why not let Jesus be the one that is there beside you and give you strength and helps you with the problems that you face? We need to understand that Jesus understands us. John wrote in John 2 and verse 25 that Jesus didn't need anyone to bear witness uh, about man, for he knew what was in man. He knows what's inside you, and he knows what's inside of me. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows it all. You know what? He still loves us, and he wants to be our Savior. And he went to the cross and died for our sins so that he could save us and bring us to God. One of my favorite passages out of the book of Hebrews, it's Hebrews 4. Of course, there it talks about Jesus, our great high priest who's passed through the heavens. And then in verse 15, he says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, the one who has been tempted in all things, as are we, yet without sin. And so he said, Let us therefore Draw near with boldness, with confidence to that throne of grace that we might find mercy, receive mercy, and might find grace to help in that time of need. He wants to help us, even in the times whenever we're being tempted and tested. He wants to be there for us, to give us the strength that we need. And I'm thankful for that. The year was 1935, and in my heart I have a picture, one I saw just the other day, of eight children standing in a row, from the oldest to the youngest. The oldest was a girl, she was 16 years old, and the youngest was a little boy that really didn't know what was going on, and he was about three. They were dressed in their summer clothes, looking pretty nice. But they were looking into the grave of their father, who had been murdered, shot in the head, right there. He owned a small trucking company, and he had made a delivery, and he was paid $3,000. Somebody robbed him, murdered him, tried to make it look like the truck had run over. Here were eight children without a dad. Fortunately, their mama had been trained as a nurse. She went to work at the hospital. It wasn't much to feed a family with eight children. She did the best that she could. The 
The older boys did what they could, and the oldest daughter did what she could. And they tried to make ends meet. The older ones sometimes took care of the younger ones because mama was at the hospital. But that didn't work all the time. And so those that were younger kind of grew up raising themselves. And the youngest boy especially had so many problems in his life. He grew up and he learned to do all the things that boys on the street learn to do. He learned to cuss. He learned to fight. He learned to smoke. He learned to drink. And he learned to steal. And as time went by, he loved to be able to steal. Even when he had money in his pocket, he wanted to steal. Whenever he got to be 18 or 19, he was out one night and he was at a bar. He got into a fight. He got arrested. They threw him into this small jail. And he was so angry, drunk and angry, that he tore up the inside of the jail tore up the mattress, tore up the bed, tore off the sink, everything he could tear up inside that jail cell, he tore it up. Well, the jailer called his older brothers and said, come get him. We can't do anything with him here. But the judge found out about it, said to him, all right, young man, you have two choices. You can either go to prison or you can join the military and pay for what you've done. He chose to go to the military, and I'm glad he did because it would be a blessing to him later in life. And he served for four years honorably and was discharged. But that didn't mean that he changed a lot of his ways. Because after he got out of the service and he got free, he began to run with the wrong crowd. And he began to live a life of crime. He was wanted in seven states. And he told his family that he had broken every law that a man could break except he had never killed anybody. He decided when he was visiting his mother and always looking over his shoulders that he would steal from a nearby business. And he stole a check writing machine and a bunch of checks. And he liked to bankrupt that company. But he made the mistake of hiding the machine in the doghouse behind his mom's house. And when it was discovered, she called the law, and they came and got him, and he served for four years in prison in Lansing, Kansas. Eventually, he was paroled, but by that time, he had a humble heart. You see, his oldest sister and her husband had gone up to Kansas. They brought a Bible to him and Bible studies and tried to teach him the best that they could. His heart humbled but he never got around to obeying the gospel. He was never baptized according to the teaching of the scriptures. Well, as time went by, he began to get out into the oil field after he got out. And he ran with a mean group of people and it wasn't long until he began to drink, he began to talk in the most ugly way. His mouth was very foul and his ways were ungodly. I remember in 1985 that he was at my father's funeral and his mouth was so foul and his ways were so ungodly and I had four little children at that time and I said in my heart you know if I never see that man again it will be all right I cannot tell you how much I regret those words and how wrong I was. During that period of time, he married a good woman who took good care of him. And it was on a Friday night that he gave me a call. I thought that was very strange. He'd never called me before. But he called me. And he said, would you come to my house and teach me about baptism? I thought, that's strange. But that's what he requested. Now, what I did not know was that just days before, he had been to the doctor at the VA. And he had gained up to 400 pounds. The doctor told him, if you don't lose some weight, quit your drinking and smoking, you're going to die. 
Now that was a pretty big lick. He began to think about it. He began to remember 25 years earlier when he got out of prison. And he remembered when his heart was humble. And he remembered how he had been taught. And he said, you know, I never got around to doing what I was supposed to do. He went and he, he knocked on the door of churches all in that small town in which he lived. He even knocked on some of the preacher's doors and nobody had time for him. In fact, one man, when he spoke to the preacher's child, said, if you ever speak to my child again, I'll have you thrown in jail. Well, it was a surprise when he called me. But when I heard the sound of his voice and what he wanted, I couldn't say no. And I got in the car with my wife and my four children, and I took them to her parents' house, which was on the way to where he lived. And with this very Bible, I walked into his house. His wife was there. He was there. And two others were there. And we began to study. Now, we studied for three or four hours. And I'm not going to tell you everything that we said. I don't think I remember. That's been a long time ago. But I am going to give you a thumbnail sketch of some of the things that we talked about with regard to baptism. So open up your Bibles because I'm not going to slow down for a while. In Matthew chapter 3, you remember that the Lord Jesus Christ came to visit John the Baptist and he wanted to be baptized. And at first John the Baptist was telling, no, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus made the statement in verse 15, permitted at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted it. After being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And of course, that was, according to John 1, the very thing that told John that this was the Son of God. Behold, a voice out of the heavens saying to confirm that. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now Jesus had walked from Nazareth where he grew up all the way to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. He came by foot. It was important to him to do that because he wanted to fulfill all righteousness. Now the baptism of John according to Mark chapter 1 verse 4 and Luke chapter 3 and verse 3 was a baptism of repentance. And it was for the forgiveness of sins. That was its purpose, to forgive sins. But it was a baptism of repentance. And, of course, he went down into the water to be baptized. Now, not everybody was willing to do what John wanted them to do, what God wanted them to do. You remember in the book of Luke, chapter 7, in verse 29, it says, And when all the people and the tax gatherers uh, heard this, that is the preaching of John, they acknowledged God's justice, that God was righteous to ask people to be baptized and to repent. And they, having been baptized with the baptism of John, that's what they did. And then it says, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. Well, he wanted everybody to know exactly why he was going to be baptized that he wanted to fulfill all righteousness, that he wanted to do the right thing for the right reason and to set the example. And even though he did not need the remission of sins because he was the son of God who had never sinned, no guile was ever found in his mouth, he still was going to do the right thing. Well, from there, we moved on to the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, to chapter 28. And here Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his apostles, and he is up in Galilee. This is not down in Jerusalem. This is up in Galilee. And he said to them in Matthew 28 and verse 18, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and then he said, and lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, or the end of the world. Now, he wanted them to go to disciple people, that is to teach them, teach them the gospel, 
about Jesus. And then to baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then to continue teaching them. You see, a part of becoming a disciple, a part of learning the gospel, is being baptized. And those things are so closely intertwined. You cannot separate. In that parallel passage in Mark chapter 16, <coughs> verses 15 and 16, you remember Jesus, and this would have been in Jerusalem, says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then the New American Standard says, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now, I think it's important to recognize that faith comes before baptism. And faith and baptism come before salvation. One of the things that's interesting is that there are six times in the New Testament where baptism and salvation are talked about within the same breath. And in every instance, the baptism comes first. And then the salvation. And never the other way around. And we'll see that again as time goes by. Now then turn with me to the book of John chapter 3. In John chapter 3 we have a situation where there is a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And he comes to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and tells him that he knows that he's a teacher that's come from God. For no one can do these signs, that is, these miracles that you do, unless God is with him. And you remember in verse 5, it says, uh, he says, or verse 3 rather, he says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you that except a man be born again, that is, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is wondering, well, how can I, an old man, be born again. I can't enter into my mother's womb a second time. And he begins to explain, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. He said, truly, truly, I say to you that except a man be born of water and the spirit. Now, that being born of water and the spirit, that's the same act. Being born of the water and the spirit, unless a man's born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be right with God, you're going to have to be born of water and the Spirit. A little bit later on, verse 7, he says, Don't marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. That's a must. You must be born again. Every ancient author for hundreds and hundreds of years understood that this birth of water and the Spirit, this new birth, was talking about baptism. In fact, nobody for hundreds and hundreds of years ever thought it to be anything else. It was not until the 1500s when people like Zwingli and others were saying that this is talking about something else. But everybody else from ancient times understood he was talking about baptism because you have the baptism of John mentioned a little bit earlier in the book of John and a little bit later in this same chapter in verse 23 it says and John was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there now there's the idea of water where the water comes in in the same chapter and they were coming and they were being baptized they were being baptized in the Jordan River down in the river <coughs> down in the river and back up. A little bit later on in this same chapter of John chapter 3 is the statement in the last verse, verse 36, that he who believes in the Son, belief is necessary, has eternal life. But he who does not obey, now King James will say believe, but there's a different word in the original. The American Standard and the ESV and other versions have it right. He who does not obey will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see, it takes more than just faith for a person to be right with the living God. When Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, King James, he says, verily, verily, I say to you. But in the original Greek New Testament, Jesus said, amen, amen, I say to you. 
Jesus was amening himself before he said that. It was something that came from God. And it was serious business. Well, from there, we went into the book of Acts chapter 2, and we went to the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, you remember that the apostles were preaching the very first gospel sermon. And I think it's important to mention this is the very first time that the gospel was ever preached because the gospel is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus had been raised from the dead just uh, days before. You remember Passover plus 50 days is Pentecost. Jesus died at Passover, was resurrected a couple of days later on the third day. And then 50 days later, you have the feast of the Passover, and they're preaching. And Jesus, during that 40-day period between Passover and Pentecost, was showing himself alive to them by many infallible, convincing proofs that he had raised from the dead. And Peter and the others all stood side by side, preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when he finished this, in verse 36... He was preaching to these Jews in Jerusalem, and he gets personal with them. He ends this sermon by saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, and then he points his finger at him, and says, Whom you crucified. These were guilty people. It's no wonder in verse 37 they were crying out, Men and brethren, what are we going to do? Why? Because they were guilty of killing Jesus, the Christ, the Lord. And Peter answered and said to them, Repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly exhorted them, encouraged them, and uh, testified to them, saying, Save yourselves, that is, be saved, from this crooked generation. They weren't yet saved. But in verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And there were added unto them who? The apostles, the 120 and the others, the believers. 3,000 souls were added to them. A little bit later on, it talks about how the saved were added to the church in verse 47. But you see, the baptized are the saved because whenever they were baptized after their repentance, they did that for the forgiveness of their sins. Now, you remember that phrase was found back in Mark 1, verse 4, and Luke 3, and verse 3, about John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Did you know that that phrase is found one more time in the book of Matthew? There are four times that phrase is used. The book of Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 28. It's the kind of passage that would be read whenever we are partaking of the Lord's Supper. And it talks about the fruit of the vine, the cup. And there he makes the point very clearly about how that they were to drink from it. He says, for this is my blood of the covenant, speaking of that fruit of the vine, which is to be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. Same reason, same presence. You see, Jesus died on the cross so that our sins would be forgiven. And Peter, on that first gospel sermon, there never was any other sermon about what to do to be saved and become a Christian before this one. Tells them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now, to make it even clearer, let me mention to you that there have been about a dozen translations that have come out, English translations of the original, in the last, oh, 25 to 50 years, that when they translate Acts 2.38, translate it, one to be baptized so that your sins will be forgiven. 
The original NIV translated that way. The DEV translated that way. The new Revised Standard Version translated it that way. Hugo McCord's translation gives it that clear as well. There are others like the Contemporary English translation the same way. And there are many others that I, I don't even remember. But I have quite a long list of them that saying what is seeing being said in Acts 2.38 is you repent, you be baptized so that your sins will be forgiven. Now let me just mention that repent is something that you do. To be baptized is something done to you. They're not entirely the same. One is an active imperative, something you do. The other is a passive imperative, something that you let somebody do to you. We'll come back to that in a little bit. When we went further into the book of Acts, we went into chapter 8. And Philip is preaching in the city of Samaria. I'm not quite sure where that city is, but he's working miracles and he's preaching the gospel. And in verse 12, the Bible says, But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized. And then it says, Men and women alive. Now this word for men is the word air. That is a male of full age and stature. And the word for women is the word gene, from which we get our word gynecologist. And that's a female of full age and stature. There were no little babies being baptized. And there were no small children being baptized. The people who were being baptized were men and women alike. And in chapter 5, verse 14, when it talks about who's in the church, it's talking about men and women. Never talking about little children and babies. And I think that's important to say. When we get farther into the book of Acts, chapter 8, Remember in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. He does that. A little bit later, verse 29, the Spirit said to Philip, You go up and join the chariot where this man from Ethiopia, uh, who is uh, a eunuch, and he's the treasurer of Queen Candace. You go up and join that, and he's reading from the Bible. He has a scroll. And he's reading from what we call the book of Isaiah. And he's reading from chapter 53. And he wants to know who this is being talked about. Who's being talked about in this chapter? Who's going to be this Messiah? Who's going to be this suffering servant who would take away the sins of the world? Verse 35 says that Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now the word for preach here is that word evangelize. And if you'll forgive an old Oklahoman, this is one of those times when I okify something. Is that a word? He gospelized Jesus to him. He preached the death, burial, and resurrection. What to do to be saved. He preached Jesus to him. We don't have a record of that sermon. We don't know anything about what he actually preached other than he preached Jesus. But I want you to look at verse 36 because there is something that gives us a clue about preaching Jesus and what he did to this man who didn't know anything about Jesus. As they went along the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Well, how did he learn that he needed to be baptized? Because Philip preached to him. He wanted to be baptized. And of course he says, if you believe, you may. And he confesses his faith. And he ordered the chariot to stop. Now look at this part. And they both went down into the water. Philip as well as the eunuch. And he baptized him. And then it says, and when they came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but he went on his way rejoicing. Now, whatever baptism is, it took place after they went down into the water and before they came out of the water. It happened while they were in the water. Well, the word baptizo means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. 
That's why they had to go to a place where there was much water there. And that's what he did. He immersed him in that water. And when he came up, of course, his sins were forgiven. And God added him to his church. Now turn the page. And we have Saul of Tarsus who is coming to Damascus. He has letters from the chief priests and others where he can arrest people of the way, that is, people in the church who were Christians. He could arrest them and could take them bound back to Jerusalem. And that's what he's going to do. Well, as he was going along, verse 3, uh, he, as he journeyed, approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, here's what Jesus told him. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. I've been reading this passage a long time. I know it quite well. And I'm here to tell you this morning there is nothing in these six verses that says that G that. Saul of Tarsus was saved by Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was blinded. And he was told to go into town. And there would be told him what he must do. And some men had to lead him into town. But it doesn't say that he was saved on the road to Damascus. And I know that he was not. And I'll show you why in a little bit. He did go into Damascus. And in verse 9 it says that he was three days and uh, without sight. And neither ate nor drank. That guy was in a world of hurt, blind. He knew what he had done, and he knew that Jesus was the one that he did it to, that he was persecuting Jesus. Don't you know that he uh, was praying a very serious prayer? Three days he was there. The Bible says in verse 11 that he was praying. I don't know about you, but I suspect that was the most serious prayer he had ever prayed in his whole life. And I can imagine he was just reviewing in his mind all of those people he had put in jail and how he held the clothes of those who stoned Stephen and how he had caused people to blaspheme and how he was so aggressive and how he was injurious, according to 1 Timothy. All the things that he had done. Don't you know, here was a man who found out he was wrong. He didn't want to be wrong. Well, there was a fellow named Ananias who came to him and began to teach him what he must do. Turn with me to Acts 22 where Saul of Tarsus, that is later on the Apostle Paul, tells the story for himself as he's defending himself. And he says in verse 13 of Acts 22 that Ananias comes to him and he was standing near him. And he said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Some people say, oh, there's proof that he was a Christian. No, no, no. That's how Jews talk to one another. They call each, each other brother. Don't you remember, men and brethren, what shall we do? Even later on, whenever those Jews who were there in front of, of Paul at Caesarea at his trial, they, they were thought of as brothers. He says, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his wrath. Now, for you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you delay? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Wash away your sins. Now at the Sanders house when we, when we do our laundry uh, we wash the dirty clothes. We don't wash the clean ones. We wash the dirt. And when we put 
dishes in the dishwasher. We wash the dirty ones. We don't wash the clean ones. Saul still had a dirty soul. He still had a dirty soul. And I think we have to understand that. You see, he wasn't saved on the road to Damascus. He wasn't saved by saying a prayer. His sins were not washed away until he arose and was baptized. Calling on the name of the Lord. Now some people think calling on the name of the Lord uh, was his prayer. But no, he was still in sin, even though he prayed for three days. What is this calling on the name of the Lord? Turn with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, which says, corresponding to that, talking about Noah and being brought safely through the water, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal, that is an inquiry. We're talking to God when we're being baptized. We're appealing to God for what? For a good conscience. You see, before you're baptized, you don't have a good conscience. And in baptism, you are appealing to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not until you come up from the grave come up with Jesus Christ, raised with him, that you have that good conscience, that newness of life that we have to have to be born again. See, that's why we need to look and see about that. Because some people say, well, Phil, are you teaching a water salvation? No, I know when I preached just the other night, on Sunday night, that we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Well, how is it that we have the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin? Well, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 makes that clear. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, you're not just baptized in water, you're baptized into Christ, have uh, been baptized into his death. Well, what did he do when he died? Wasn't that when he shed his blood? That's when he shed his blood. So when you're baptized in that water, you're baptized into Christ, and you're baptized into his death. <laughs> yes. He says, therefore, we've been buried with him. See how baptism is a burial in water. Through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, in order that um, uh, by through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. He says, for if we become united, that is planted, with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, listen to me now, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. When are you freed from sin? When you die with Christ. When you're buried with Him. And when you rise up, when you're raised up, you're raised up to what? Newness of life. When did Jesus have newness of life? When God raised Him from the dead. When do we have newness of life? When God raises us up. Our old man of sin is dead. And we become new, born again people when we are baptized. That's very clear in this passage. Now, there's one more point I want to make before we go any farther, and that's from Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And in Colossians chapter 2, there's kind of a parallel to Romans 6. Colossians 2 and verse 12. And he says there, having been buried with him in baptism. There's that baptism burial again. That's why it's not sprinkling, but an immersion. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith, through faith in what? In the working of God. 
who raised him from the dead. And just like God worked in raising Jesus from the dead, in baptism, God is raising you up with him through faith. Then he says, and when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions. There it is. There it is. Now, when I look at a passage like this, one of the things that becomes very clear is that baptism is really not your work. It's God's work. Now let's think about it. Let's review a little bit. Isn't it God who causes us to be born again? John 1, 11 and 12. It's God who causes us to be born again. It's God who saves us. It's God who forgives us. It's God who adds us to the church. It is God who makes us his children. Galatians 3, 26 and 7, and that takes place in baptism. It is God who unites us with Christ, plants us with him so that we grow with him. It is God who buries us and raises us with Christ. You see, God is the one who's active. I hear people say to me, he said, oh, Phil, oh, Phil, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. And when I hear someone say that, one of the things that I want to say to them is this. Why are you interfering with the work of God? Now, if Chris is up here and he's baptizing someone, or Greg, or any one of you preachers are baptizing somebody, I've baptized a few people in my lifetime. The baptizer is the one doing the work. Chris is the one doing stuff. Chris is the one who takes him and puts him under the water and brings him up. Physically. But it is God who is working spiritually. Now you have to believe. You have to love the Lord. You have to repent. You have to do the confessing. But the one thing that God does is he's the one who saves you. And he does it whenever you are being baptized. Because that's the working of God. Well, we looked at Titus 3 and 1 Peter 3 and a few other passages. And after about three or four hours, we all changed our clothes. We walked down into the pond that was behind the house. And it was as warm, Chris, as a baptistry on that summer day. And I baptized him, I baptized his wife, and I baptized two others. I never saw such a change and a man in my life. And I'll have more to say about that a little bit later. Now, the title of this lesson is, Will Jesus Really Help Me? Well, one of the ways he helps us is by forgiving us all our sins. And his blood is able to cleanse us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7. It's able to cleanse us from everything. Sometimes people wonder, well, if I'm baptized, am, have I really been forgiven? Well, he said he would. You remember in Hebrews 8, verse 12, about the new covenant. There God promises, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and their sins will I remember no more. If God could forgive the wicked people who killed Jesus on the cross whenever they were baptized on the day of Pentecost, he can forgive you too. If God could forgive Saul of Tarsus, who called himself the chief of sinners, when he was baptized and his sins were washed away, he can forgive you too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, there Paul wrote, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gets personal with the church at Corinth, and he says, and such were some of you. Now, if he had stopped there, that'd be pretty bad. But then comes that word, but. And the most beautiful passage is seen to come after the word, but. But you were washed. God cleaned you up. But you were sanctified. God made you holy. But you were justified. God declared that you are no longer guilty. You're innocent. He pardoned you. He forgave you. And he did not hold that sin against you. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's what God can do. And God sets us free. Now, forgiveness, I think, is important. I got a scar right there on my chin. Five stitches. I was 10 years old, and my brother pulled me off of the back of a bicycle because he wanted to ride there. He pulled me off, and I fell on the pavement, and my chin kind of bounced on the pavement, and I had a bloody place there, and I had to go to the doctor and get it stitched up. Now, a 10-year-old boy is not too brave whenever somebody comes at him with a needle putting their chin and try to put stitches in. I've never had stitches before. Fortunately, he deadened my, my chin, and he stitched me up. A little bit later that same summer, my brother caused me to have a big old scar on my side. I'm not going to show that. <laughs> but it was the same brother. And that was more than 60 years ago. And I still have the scars. But I love my brother. And the scars don't matter. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19 says that God does not count our trespasses against us. That's so that we can be reconciled and be friends with God. He says, I'm just not going to think about that anymore. I love you and I care about you and I'm not going to care about I don't care about those things. I want to be with you. I want to know that I love my brother Joe and these scars don't. If I didn't tell people, they wouldn't know. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Not counting our trespasses against us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has it removed our transgressions, our iniquities from us. Psalm 103. He sets us free from sin. Whenever we become Christians, whenever we obey from the heart, as we talked about last night, we're no longer slaves of sin, but we become slaves of righteousness, freed from that sin. Not only that, he protects us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. You can trust him, who will not allow you to be tempted, but will with the temptation also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He'll be there when you need him. And he'll help you if you'll call on him. He'll be there. Not only will he set us free from sin, he will also help us with a, an abundant, victorious life. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10 and verse 10. And in Ephesians 1 and 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We already have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places when we're in Christ. I love Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, where whenever Paul is praying, he has to just stop and praise God at the end of the prayer. And he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God can do more than we ask him to do, more than we can imagine. I tell you very frankly on a very personal level, 
I could not imagine 15 years ago what I have seen God do in the last 15 years. And how he has provided in answer to prayer more than we ask or even imagine or think. Third thing is we got one another. Yes, you have you and I have you and you have me. We have each other. That's why the Lord built a church. Because he knew people needed each other. To stay strong spiritually. To keep their fires burning. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. When Jackie and I married 50 years ago, one of the things that we had in our rings on the inside of it was a statement that two are better than one. That comes from Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. And I think about how often a brother or a sister has helped me in a time of weakness. To be strong. To say no to temptation. To say yes to the Lord. My sweet Jackie has made a better man out of me. My love for her has kept me from going in the wrong direction. Christians need Christians to stay saved and to remain faithful. We need each other. And that's why we need to be here every time the doors are open so that we can encourage each other to help each other to go to heaven. Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2 says, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, you restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Folks, we need each other. We need each other. I never saw such a change in a man's life. Never. From that day forward, I never heard another foul word come from his mouth. He never smoked another cigarette. He never took another drink. He became a different man completely from that time forward. Here was a man who spent his time with a songbook singing songs, singing hymns, and praying and reading his Bible and studying. And he began to think one day, he said, you know, I can never go back up to Lansing, Kansas because they'll never let me into the prison there because I had been a prisoner. But you know, he thought about what he could do because there were young men who were going in the wrong direction just like he did. And he thought, well, maybe I can go over to Guthrie, the county seat, and maybe I can get into the jail and I can talk to them so... He went over there and he talked to the sheriff and he said, can I preach to these prisoners? And the sheriff led him. And he began to preach to them and it wasn't long till some of them wanted to be baptized. Well, they didn't have a baptistry in that little county jail. But there was a farmer who went to church, where he went to church, who had a pickup and had one of those tanks where they fed the, or watered the cattle. And they hauled that over, put it in the jail yard, turned on the hose and filled it full of water and baptized them. And he said, you know, if I can do that here, I can do it in Watonga, and I can do it in Okarchi, and I can do it in other places. And he began to make a regular circuit of people that he was preaching to in those county jails and baptizing people. And he had called me and he said, oh, Phil, it just gets better and better. And it did, and he encouraged my heart every single time. It wasn't long until he found out about the state prison ministry. So he began to go to various places to Lexington, and he would go to Granite, and he would go down to McAllister where they had death row. He would go in and talk to people that no one else wanted to talk to. He talked to every person on death row, and many of them became Christians, members of the Lord's church. He would talk to people who were criminally insane, one man, they said, don't you get close to his bars. If he can grab a hold of you, he'll choke you to death. You stand way over on the wall by the window. Don't get close to him. 
Well, he did what he was told, but he spoke kindly to the man. And the man said, you're the first person in two years who's had a kind word for me. He gave him a Bible. He gave him other books. He helped him and blessed him. And about six months later, that man got out of that part of the prison. They got back into the rest of it. Don't know much more than that. But here was a man whose life was changed because somebody spoke kindly to him. Perhaps you remember the name Jeffrey Dahmer. There's still movies and documentaries coming out about him, even though he was in prison in 1994. What you may not know about Jeffrey Dahmer is that up until the age of 11, he attended the Church of Christ in Illinois. His parents divorced and he quit going to church. And he began to go in the wrong direction. He became a homosexual. He became a serial killer. And he was also a cannibal. Bad, bad man. He buried his victims underneath the house he was living in, in the dirt. But he was caught. And he was put in jail. Early in 1994, there was a sister in the Lord named Mott. Her last name was Mott. I don't know her first name. She lived in Virginia, and she sent to him a World Bible School Bible study. And in Crescent, Oklahoma, Curtis G. Booth sent him a World Bible School Bible study. And uh, I think, gladly, they were different studies. And he went through both of them. And he finished. And in April 1994, he wrote a letter and he sent it to Curtis Booth and he said, I have finished both of these studies. And he mentioned Sister Mott. And he says, I know that I want and I need to be baptized. And then he talked about a little problem as far as the chaplain and being able to do it. Kurt got on the phone and he called one of the preachers up in Wisconsin who went in and baptized him. And would meet with him on the Lord's Day from that period of time until November when he was beaten to death. But here was a man who learned the truth. With his own hands, Curtis Booth baptized more than 1,100 people. And the group that he went with baptized many, many more. He was truly a tremendous man. The last time that I ever had a chance to speak to him, he was in a nursing home. And oh, what a good man he was to the people there, especially to those who would get sick, and those who were passing away. Everybody in that whole place loved him. In the last conversation I had, he was trying to win a soul to Christ. Yes, to win a soul to Christ. You remember the picture that I told you about, that I saw the other day, of eight children standing in a row. They were looking into the grave of their father who had been murdered. Well, their father was my grandfather. And it was my mother and daddy who went up to the jail in Lansing, Kansas, who tried to teach him. My daddy did not know that he ever became a Christian. But my mother did. And I believe it was my mother who told him to call me. And you remember I had said in my heart in 1985, if I ever see that man again, it'll be all right. I can't tell you how wrong I was. And I was wrong for three reasons. I was wrong because I judged another man's soul of being unworthy of the gospel. I was wrong because I 
for God, the power of God, and how God can transform people's lives and make them into the man and the woman that he wants them to be, how he can take the broken and make them whole again. Take the wicked and make them righteous. I had forgotten what God could do. And I forgot what God had done for me in forgiving my sins and helping me and blessing me and being there for me when I needed it. I tell you, the, the lesson tonight is what God can do and how God saves and how God helps us to stay saved. And if we ask the question, will God really help me? I want to tell you a thousand times, yes, he will help us when we need his help. And he will be there for us. And I have seen it again and again and again. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, let God work on you. Let God bury you and raise you with Christ and forgive your sins. As you confess your faith and out of love, repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ, into his death, where his blood can wash you clean. If you're a brother or sister, maybe you've let sin back into your life and you flirted with it. And it began to get a hold of you. Maybe there are times whenever you've let it overcome you. Brother, sister, isn't it time that you repented, confessed those sins, and asked God to forgive you and get right with Him? That's what Christians do whenever they've done wrong, they repent of it sins and they confess them and if we confess our sins he's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness it's like the prodigal son who was dead and is alive and was lost and found you can be found and you can be alive you can come to God and if you will tonight God can make a difference in your life don't do nothing. Let God help you to become the man, the woman that God intended for you to be right with the living God. And do it tonight while we stand.